welcome. I'm Elise Taloni, and I manage community outreach for Summit Medical Group. And I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for connecting with us um, via Zoom this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank Mary Kirsch and the Fairlawn Library for hosting us for this community lecture. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Chris Enzarello, and he is a member of Summit Medical Group's orthopedics team in Paramus. He is a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in sports related injuries of the knee, shoulder and elbow. He completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at the hospital of the University of Penn, Pennsylvania in Philly and uh, followed with a fellowship in sports medicine at NYU Hospital for Joint Diseases in New York City. Dr. Anzarello is an expert in the treatment of knee and shoulder conditions, including repairs, reconstructions, and fractures. A list of his surgical areas of expertise can be found on our website, smgortho.com. Before I turn things over to our presenter this evening, I wanted to let you know that the slides being presented this evening are available to be viewed on Summit Medical Group's SlideShare um, account. I, will, I have posted the URL link in the chat function for the Zoom. The library also has a copy of that link if you'd like to reach out directly to them if you wanna review the slides after the presentation's over. We will hold a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions in the chat function just make sure you direct them to myself and Dr. Enzarello so we can actually see your questions. Um, and we only ask that you please keep your questions general and related to the content being presented this evening. Any questions about medications or treatments being prescribed directly to you, those questions should be directed to your prescribing physician. So now, without further ado, I'll turn the Zoom over to Dr. Enzarello. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Elise, and thank you, Mary. And I wanna also thank the Fairlawn community for the opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. Uh, so I figured we, we would talk about a very common topic, knee arthritis and cartilage problems in the knee, which is probably the most common uh, problem and disorder that affects patients that come through my office. Um, so this is my background, uh, my undergraduate, Training was at Duke University, went to medical school at the University of Toledo. My residency was at University of Pennsylvania, and I did a sports fellowship at NYU and Hospital for Joint Diseases, and my master's in business from Marist College. Um, so if we look at the knee, it is the largest joint in the body. Uh, it's in, it also happens to be the joint that most people have a problem with, right? It's composed of three bones, the top part here is the tibia, and this is called the tibial plateau, and it forms the base of the knee joint. As you can see, it's divided into halves. There's a lateral, there's a lateral side and a medial side, and the femur creates the top of the knee and the femur bone, and then the patella sits in the front. There are four main ligaments that stabilize the knee. This is the ACL and the PCL, and they're called the cruciate ligaments because they make a cross in the knee. There's the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament, which provides stability for the knee. And there's also two meniscuses or menisci, which are cartilage structures that act as shock absorbers to cushion weight when we step from the femur to the tibia. And the articular cartilage, this is a another type of cartilage. This is a cartilage that lines the bone. You can see it here on the femur real well in this diagram, but there's also an equivalent cartilage on the tibia. And that, the presence of that is, is, is good. And a lot of the problems we have is injuries to that. So when we talk about arthritis, it's derived from the joint, uh, from, the, from the Greek, arthros for joint and itis meaning inflammation. The most common problem with uh, patients suffering from knee arthritis is pain. Number two is swelling, stiffness, loss of function, Patients can complain of clicking, popping, the knee giving out, giving way. There are many types of arthritis. The most common is what we call osteoarthritis, which is generalized wear and tear on the joint that occurs with age and use. However, there's, there's been over 100 different dis described types of arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which is an autoimmune arthritis, 
septic arthritis from an infection, post-traumatic after fractures, gout can cause arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, et cetera. There's many types. And the overall cost to the United States in lost wages and economic productivity is thought to be over $300 billion. So it's a very expensive problem for our country and our society. So when a patient first comes into the office, we always start with a history and a physical exam. So the history, what I'm listening for is the onset of pain. Was it an acute onset or was this just a slow, gradual process that started? Was there a prior injury? What is the family history? Arthritis tends to run in family. Okay. So when we look at a patient, there are two main kind of deformities. This gentleman down here has a bowed leg, as we call a varus deformity. That's the most common. And you can see in this lady up here, she has a knock knee or a in, inward bowing leg. That's a valgus deformity. It's a little bit less common, but both are problematic in that they alter the joint forces. Uh, we look for swelling. This is an example of an effusion here. Uh, you can see compared to this gentleman's left knee, this right knee has fluid, and this is where it tends to accumulate in the superior pouch of the knee. Uh, I also want to know where they hurt. So I'll ask patients to point what part of the knee. Is it the outside of the knee, the inside, behind the kneecap? Because if it matches their exam and their x-ray, it's pretty diagnostic on the type of arthritis they have. So this is a depiction of what happens when a knee develops arthritis. This is the articular cartilage, as we see here, or the lining of the joint. And cartilage, unfortunately, has no ability to heal. It's as good as it is the day we're born. And if it wears or if it breaks down, it's not replaced and it's not repaired. It's almost like uh, rubber on tires. As the more you drive, it just wears away. Uh, and when it wears away completely, we have bone is exposed. And when bone is exposed, the joint just doesn't work as well. And when we grind bone to bone, patients tend to have a lot of pain. So these are some basic x-rays. An x-ray is, is, is the best test when trying to define knee arthritis. This is a picture of a normal knee right here. And you, you can see it's divided into halves and there's good space in between the bones. That's occupied by that articular cartilage. And that's what I'm looking for, whether a patient has arthritis or not, okay? If we look at this x-ray here, you can tell there's an asymmetry. On the inside part of the joint, there's a little bit less space than there is here. So this knee is developing arthritis. And then if we take it to the other extreme, we have x-rays such as this, where there's no cartilage at all. And this is considered severe or advanced osteoarthritis. A patient with an x-ray like this might have a hard time even walking a city block uh, with a significant amount of pain. Uh, MRIs are, are frequently ordered. They're not exactly, they're not the test of choice for diagnosing arthritis, but a lot of patients do have MRIs and they do have characteristic findings that help us secure the diagnosis. This is a picture of a normal MRI. And you can see this is a, a side view of the knee. This is the bone of the femur here. Here's the tibia. And this is the cartilage. As you can see, it's a, another type of gray. This bow tie structure is the meniscus. And this is a good looking, this is a, a, a normal looking knee. Here's the calf muscle and the uh, patella here. We, if, if we com, uh, compare that to, to this uh, MRI right here, this is a big bone spur. You see these irregularities. This meniscus is pushed down. Uh, we have loss of that cartilage. Uh, in this MRI here, the bone can actually necrose a little bit and the bone can die underneath. And this is a, a significant source of pain. So that's what arth arthritis looks like on MRI. So we always start with simple office-based treatments, uh, non-surgical. And uh, believe it or not, the, the vast majority of patients can improve their pain just with simple modifications. So first thing we'll talk about is activity modification. I'll recommend biking over running. Just that less impact might be enough to, to help. Uh, I'll talk to patients, I'll counsel them about their weight. Uh, for every pound in, in the abdomen that a patient carries, the knee feels five pounds for every one pound. So just by losing a simple 10 pounds, it's like taking 50 pounds of pressure off the knee joint. 
Uh, physical therapy is another uh, treatment modality to work on range of motion, strengthening and flexibility, which helps the knee function better. Anti-inflammatory medicines such as Aleve, Motrin, Advil can help. Uh, natural uh, uh, herbs uh, such as turmeric, arnica are natural anti-inflammatories. Glucosamine chondroitin is a cartilage precursor. Some people feel help inflammation. Uh, an anti-inflammatory diet is helpful, high in fruits and vegetables and decreases free radical formation and helps keep the knee from uh, becoming as irritated as it is. Uh, and then there are some braces, we call unloader braces, which can strap to the knee and help alter that uh, challenge in alignment that we sometimes see. Okay, injections are another common uh, modality that I use in the office. And they're kind of a staple for the office treatment of knee arthritis. Steroid injections or cortisone injections are the most common. They've been around the longest. It's based on the normal uh, hormone of cortisol produced by the adrenal gland. And it's, it's slightly altered to make cortisone so that it lasts longer in the body. And you mix that with local anesthetic and it can be injected right into the knee joint. And it usually gives pain relief for three months, six months, sometimes even up to a year. So if that's the case, that can just be repeated periodically. Uh, gel injections have become very common. These are the common names. You may have heard of these, Orthovis, Synvis, Uflexa. Uh, they're advertised quite a bit. So uh, there's large uh, public knowledge of these. And what this is, is a, is a large protein. It's called hyaluronic acid, which the knee normally makes but when it develops arthritis, it just stops making it. So by supplementing the hyaluronic acid into the knee, it attracts water with it, which helps soften the, the cartilage. All right, there are two other injections I'll talk a little bit more about. One is called platelet-rich plasma, or PRP for short. All right, and the other are stem cell injections, or BMAC stands for bone morphogenic uh, autologous, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Uh, chondri uh, bone morphogenic autologous chondrocyte. Uh, and it's good in theory, but there's a lot of a question about its efficacy. So when we talk about platelet-rich plasma, you know, what is that? Uh, it's called PRP, gets a, lot, gets a decent amount of press. What it is is a, a subset of your normal blood. So about 60 cc's of blood is withdrawn from a patient's vein. It's placed into a centrifuge and that spins down all the red blood cells, which are really not helpful for this problem. And then what remains is the plasma. And in the plasma, we have platelets, which have a lot of growth factors, which are thought to decrease inflammation. So then this layer of the, uh, of the concentrate is, is sucked out and then injected into the shoulder or, the, or particularly the knee uh, or tendons to try and affect healing. Uh, is there a role for stem cells? So... Uh, stem cells get a lot of uh, press. Um, do they work? We're not quite sure, to be honest. Uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, that is a uh, taking of bone from the iliac crest or the hip where the blood is sucked out, concentrated down, and then injected back into the knee. And then also stem cells can be found in adipose tissues. So a liposuction procedure can be performed to isolate adipose cells and then you can run saline through it to get the mesenchymal stem cells. And then these can be concentrated down and injected into the knee. It's unclear whether it, it really helps. Uh, there's a lot of science that says it doesn't. And then there's some that says it does. So I, I would say that the jury is open. Currently, it's really not covered by insurance. It tends to be quite expensive. So there's a lot of aggressive marketing out there by physicians uh, to try to capitalize on, on folks in pain. So I would just say buyer beware at this point but we, it's really just too soon to tell whether stem cells really are gonna make a difference long-term, all right? So when we talk about knee arthritis, this is kind of what it looks like actually inside the knee. So this is an arthroscopic photo inside of a knee. This is the femoral condyle, this is the tibia, all right? And then normally cartilage is smooth and white. It almost looks like a cue ball, like you can see right here. And then as it wears, it starts to become, it almost looks like a crab meat. Uh, or it, it, it frays and it just doesn't work as well. So we can sometimes shave this down to smooth it out. That's what we call an arthroscopic debridement. 
It's not going to cure the problem, but it may decrease some of the clicking or popping symptoms. And we can contrast that down to here. Now, so this is an arthroscopic photo of a patient with very advanced knee arthritis. You can see right here that there's no cartilage remaining on this patient's femur and no cartilage remaining on this patient's tibia. There's a little cartilage here around the rim, but this patient is essentially grinding bone to bone. So if you scope a knee like this, this patient uh, has, has a poorer prognosis than this patient. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about cartilage repair or cartilage restoration. It's kind of a hot topic in, in uh, sports medicine because cartilage injuries are, are very uh, disabling for athletes. So, and that since there's no healing ability, everyone is trying to build a better mousetrap at how to repair cartilage. So these are just some of the things that are done out there. All right, number one would be uh, what we call uh, either take cartilage from another area of the knee, as you can see in this patient here. So if the cartilage defect was here, you can harvest plugs from one area of the knee and move them over. It's what we call a oats procedure. You can also do that with a cadaveric piece of bone. So if there's a large injury to the cartilage in one spot, you could take a similar size plug and implant that in, uh, basically filling the size to size. There are some um, off the shelf, what we call scaffolds. Okay, this, is, this would be an example of one. So this is the normal cartilage of the knee. And then you can see this defect here. And then in it was placed a cartilage scaffold. So which is a building block that if we pick into the bone, we can get some stem cells to come out and hopefully we'll populate the scaffold to grow new cartilage. It's another treatment option. This Macy here is a newer technique that is um, getting some traction. It stands for articulus chondrocyte implantation. This is an interesting procedure in that it's really does try to regrow cartilage. Well, it's a two-stage procedure in that we would biopsy cartilage from a patient that would be sent to say uh, the lab is in Boston and then they grow chondrocytes or the cartilage cells and then send it back to us as a membrane. You can see right here, we take it out as a membrane and then uh, place it into uh, the, the knee with some fiber and glue and then uh, cartilage cells can actually regrow in that particular situation. Okay, so knee realignment, th this are, these, before the days of knee replacement, this is really all that was available. It's still done today and I do do it, but it's mostly in, in younger patients, all right? So if we, if we look at this knee right here, okay? This patient is clearly on the inside of his knee, he's grinding bone to bone and the outside of the knee is relatively unaffected. So this patient would have pain uh, on the inside and none on the outside. So what we can do is actually make a cut through the tibia and shift the alignment or open that side of the knee up so that we can see we have um, decreased or increased joint space on either side. And this would be done for someone who has a knock knee deformity. We could make a, a little cut in the bone and open that up to straighten the leg out. These are realignment procedures, mostly indicated for, uh, I'm sorry, uh, young athletes who want to continue playing but are hampered by, by the degree of arthritis they have. Oh, I'm sorry. So next thing we'll talk about are our knee replacements. Our knee replacements get a lot of uh, press. It's a very common operation. In the United States, currently there's about three to 400,000 done every year. Uh, and of knee replacements, there's uh, several types, okay? So there's partial knees and total knees, all right? And, the, and basically it's dependent upon where is the disease. So if we look at, uh, the, for example, here, this knee, uh, the cartilage on the outside of the knee is okay. The cartilage on the inside of the knee is worn down. So this particular patient would benefit from a partial knee replacement, which you can see right here. Whereas this particular patient, the schematic, you have loss of cartilage throughout the entire knee. So just replacing one side would not help. So in a total knee, the whole entire knee is resurfaced so that we have a new bearing surface that covers the knee. Uh, and on the tibia, you can see an equivalent side. And then in between is what we call the poly 
or it's a low friction plastic so that the two surfaces can move against each other without uh, friction or, or pain. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, this is uh, it's kind of the way I've gravitated to doing my total knees is what we call robotic assistance. And this is some pretty, really fascinating technology. This here is, is a striker product. It's called the Mako robot. And this is what we call the robotic arm. And attached to the end of the robotic arm is a saw that helps us in our surgery. So when I do knee replacements now, we'll get a CAT scan or a CT scan of the knee, which is basically a three-dimensional picture of the knee. That is sent to Stryker, and then a preoperative plan comes back. That is in turn fed into the Mako robot, and then that is we use that to carry it out during surgery. So this would be a pre-surgical plan. Okay, This would be the CAT scan, which gives us three-dimensional pictures through this patient's knee. And then what was generated is a knee that fits this patient, dare I say perfectly, where everything is lined up exactly right to line to line. So we, we have a custom fit. And then during surgery, we will register the patient to this preoperative plan to make the cuts precisely as we planned. Here's an example of a partial knee, which fits right on the inner half of the knee. We can see it on the lateral side, the anterior side, and the posterior side. So this is an example of, um, of a surgical case. Now you can see the surgeons here, they're not even really looking in the knee anymore. This is the Mako robot. It's draped out sterile. You can see the plastic bag around it so that it's uh, not gonna contaminate the case. The saw is held to that. And the surgeon and his assistant are actually looking at the screen here when they make their cuts, which are guided by the Mako robot. So it, it is essentially guiding the cuts to a degree of accuracy that is difficult to obtain just by the human eye. For example, the, the precision are to within a half a millimeter. And you know, that's a really hard, I mean, that's a very fine degree of, of accuracy. And when we talk about angles and degrees, it can change it to a, a one degree uh, increment. So with that kind of precision, it allows us to what we call press fit our knees. So traditionally, when we would do knee replacements for someone with advanced arthritis, you can see this haziness here. This is actually a cemented knee replacement, okay? And we would use this, what we call bone cement to actually affix the knee replacement in place. Problem with cement is that it, it can wear out with time, almost like a foundation can, of a house can develop cracks. We can get cracks in the cement that we use to hold our joint replacements in. So that will can limit the longevity of these implants, as opposed to on this uh, picture, this x-ray, you, you don't see bone cement because this is an uncemented technique. Uh, and the thought here is that the longevity of this could be potentially infinite uh, or, or at least longer than or a total knee, which we used to quote patients maybe anywhere from 15 years, 10 years. Now we're seeing some knees last 20, 30, sometimes even longer, uh, these knee replacements can go. So the, you know that's obviously ideal. We don't wanna have to take patients back to surgery any more than we have to. So uh, that's, I, I think, a very exciting thing in uh, <clears throat> knee replacement surgery. Okay. So anyway, I, um, that's a brief uh, introduction on uh, knee disorders with cartilage. And I wanted to uh, thank you guys for listening. And I figured I would open it up for questions at this point. Hi, everyone. Yes, I just want to remind everyone that they could submit their questions in the chat function. Um, but to get the ball rolling, we do have some questions already. So Dr. Anzarello, can a patient have 100% improvement post-surgery and what are the rough percentages of outcomes? I'm gonna give you the classic surgeon answer is that, well, that depends, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess it really depends, A, what the surgery is and what outcome are you specifically looking for? 
So one outcome could be pain relief. And if you want to say, am I going to be 100% out of pain? That is possible. Uh, when we study knee replacements, there are about maybe 70% of patients to 80% will say, I have, we call it the forgotten knee. They, once they recover from the surgery, they just forget they even had it done. They, they just have no pain in the knee. And that's obviously what we strive for. However, it's not 100%. But some patients do get 100%. Um, so if we're talking about a cartilage procedure, the goal there is to return someone to sport. Now, will they say that that knee is 100%? I mean, I, I think that is a very high bar. I, I, I don't ever like to sit, tell anyone you're going to be perfect. You're going to be 100%. I, I think that's getting their expectations a little bit, little bit high. But if you tailor it to say, well, you know what, you used to play soccer, I think we can get you back to playing soccer. I, I, would, I would take that as a success as opposed to 100%. So what do you tell patients who, um, you know, they're having surgery, they've had surgery, they're post-surgery, and um, what do you advise them to do to um, improve a better outcome? So what should they be doing, you know, as far as rest? When do they, can they start to resume activity? What's your advice post-surgery? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll speak more specifically towards replacement type surgeries. Uh, and the best thing is to get up and get moving and do your physical therapy as best as you can. Uh, a lot of these surgeries can be done perfectly. However, if the patient participation is not there, the outcome will not be great. And it's almost like a coach, right? Like the coach can tell the athlete what to do, but if the athlete doesn't go out and practice, the, the, it, there's not going to be a great outcome. And so physical therapy is combined with, with daily stretches and, and home exercises. If a patient will dedicate the time and effort to do the proper rehab, that's probably the most predictable, uh, most predictable activity that a patient can do to help themselves have that ideal outcome. You know, where, where you know, I want all my patients to feel 100%, and I want them to be pain free. And the ones that do tend to do all the things right, uh, where they they do their physical therapy. They don't. Um, you know, they, they don't skip out or, or they do their exercises every day and they take care of themselves. So I, that, that is how we patients can help themselves. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, right now in this time, if someone wants to come in to see you, um, I'm sure certain protocols are in place for in-office visits um, to minimize exposure to COVID. What mm -hmm. are some of the protocols that are in place in the office if someone wanted to come in to see you? Uh, well, number one, we, we uh, have socially distanced our, our waiting room, so uh, seats are spread out. So upon entering the building, uh, we have um, the proper dividers. All our staff wears masks. We practice impeccable hand hygiene. We clean the rooms after every patient. I wash my hands before and after and during each patient visit. Uh, we, you, we have uh, patients, uh, if there's not, our waiting room is big enough where it's not crowded, but if, if it is particularly busy, uh, patients will wait in their car so that there's not crowding in the waiting room. Everyone has a private room. Um, we also can do virtual visits for, I have some patients who are immunocompromised and really have a lot of anxiety about even leaving their house. And I, I can do visits to them uh, just from their own computer. So we still do offer that. We're not doing it as much now as we were at the height of the pandemic, but that still is, uh, I still have several a week for our virtual visits. So that's another option. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I think it's pretty safe. I, I, I go to doctors, my, I'm a patient myself, so I, I feel pretty comfortable. And I think most of our patients feel comfortable. So uh, we're, we're, we're doing everything we can to decrease the risk. And I, I think it's as good a time as any to, to get treatment. Agreed. So um, we do have a question about from one of our attendees about acupuncture for knee pain. 
saying that, you know, what if a patient is not a good candidate for surgery? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, you know, is acupuncture an option? Have, you know, have you ever had any patients that you've recommended that for? Uh, well, sure. Uh, you know, acupuncture is an option. Uh, it's, I don't think anyone can tell anyone why it works. We just know that it does for certain patients. It doesn't work on everyone, but for someone who, uh, so if, if we're gonna take surgery off the table, let's just say a patient has a really bad heart or maybe they have very bad lungs or they're just not a great surgical candidate for medical reasons, maybe they're fighting cancer. You know, what do we do for someone with a bad knee? Uh, and, you know, I mentioned a lot of the non-surgical things we do, such as injections, medicines, braces, physical therapy. I would put acupuncture in there as, as a reasonable treatment option. Uh, and there are several, a lot of the physical therapy offices that I'll refer patients to also have acupuncture in there. And it, it cert look, it's certainly worth trying. Uh, does it help everyone? It, no, it, it doesn't. For some patients, it's a real air ball. But for some patients, it, it's great. And if it can alleviate pain and if it can help uh, increase the quality of life, it's certainly very safe. And, you know, the, the biggest problem I have with that is, 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 is payment, you know, because it tends not to be covered so by, by insurance companies. But, you know, it, it's certainly worth a try. And I would, I would never dissuade anyone from doing it uh, because I, I've seen some really good success stories. Another thing I would mention is that there's a newer uh, pain technique that uh, I, I personally don't do, but uh, I do have partners in my office that do where they, they take the sensory nerves, they, they find the nerves that connect to the knee and feed back pain to the knee, and they will uh, try to ablate those nerves. So if you can take out the sensory nerve that's feeding pain back to the brain, you can theoretically decrease the pain that is felt. And that is a, uh, a minor uh, pain procedure. So that, that's relatively new that's also being done. So I'll throw that out there as well as a non-surgical option. So, you know, in talking about different options of what's covered, um, you know, you did talk about stem cell injections um, mm -hmm. and mentioned that, you know, sometimes that's not covered. Um, but what about PRP? You know, is, is that generally covered by insurance or? So PRP is not, uh, at least currently it's not. And there's a, the day, so when, Procedures are brought up to insurance companies and Medicare. What they want is, is data. They want uh, studies that show compared to a, a placebo that there is a, a, that there's a proven benefit. And you know, they do the same thing with, with drug trials or vaccine trials. I mean, they're looking for uh, a good trial to show efficacy. And with PRP, the problem is that there's a lot of studies out there that show that it works about as well as placebo. And there are some that show a clear benefit. So the data is mixed. And when the, jur so when the jury's out and the data is mixed, you know, Medicare and a lot of these uh, insurance companies, are, they're, just not gonna, um, they're just not gonna pay for it. So currently we, we, uh, we can eat, sometimes I can combine it with another procedure, which is covered, in which case I've done it in that. Uh, I've had patients just pay out of pocket. It, it's, uh, it's uh, several hundred dollars, so it's not um, you know, cost prohibitive. Uh, but currently, I, I don't think there's any straight out 100% coverage for the procedure. So I just want to say to everyone, you know, there, these have been some good questions, um, but um, if anyone has any questions, definitely you know, um, share them in the chat. Uh, we've gone through the questions submitted so far. So last call, I guess, for questions. Ah, some are coming through, okay. All right, what type of provider would do the procedure involving the sensory nerve? So that would be a pain management specialist. Mm, and we do, we have a pain, pain um, management actually in in our paramus office. Well, right, we have, Dr. Oziak, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oziak. She's actually now in our paramus office as well. 
Perfect. Uh, okay. We have Dr. Osumaloa as well. So nice. we have, we have we have two that are are that are doing that. Okay. So um, if if anyone was interested, they could call the Paramus office, the number's up on the screen and, and, and inquire about that. Um, is it true that the robot cannot be used on double knee replacement surgery? That is 100% false. Oh, um, good, I'm glad she asked the question. So yeah, you debunk so, that myth. No, uh, actually the first, the first robotic case I did was a bilateral knees and yeah, no, I, you, you basically just upload two computer programs and you do one side and then you just have to move the robot to the other side of the table and then you do the other side. So no, it can absolutely be used in, in bilateral knee replacements. Um, I actually, I don't think I mentioned, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a topic in and of itself is because is, a lot of patients have two bad knees, right? Because you know, arthritis tends to happen as we get older, runs in families. So if one knee goes, sometimes the other knee goes. And so if someone's got two bad knees, should you operate on them one at a time or you should do you both at the same time? And there's pros and cons to, to both. Uh, some patients will say, well, you know what? I just want to have surgery one time, get it all over with one recovery, and then I'll be done. And, it, you know, very reasonable. Uh, I will do bilateral knee replacements for someone who is, it, it, you know, the downside is it's a bigger stress on the heart, bigger stress on the lungs. So for someone who is medically unstable, or maybe it had a heart attack in the past, or has some um, blockage in their, in their coronary arteries, or, or has uh, uh, not great lungs, then, I, then I, I, would, I would counsel them away from doing both knees at once. But for a 50, 60 year old healthy person to do both knees at once is quite reasonable. And, and you, you definitely can use a robot for both. Great. Okay, so right now we don't have any additional questions in the queue. Um, so let's, we'll give it another moment to see. Um, oh, actually we do, they're coming now. So what type of anesthesia is used in knee replacement? So the, the standard uh, for, the standard is, is a spinal anesthesia. So spinal anesthesia has several advantages in that it's, it's safer in terms of the heart and lungs for the patient. Number two, it dilates the vessels. So the chances of getting blood clots after surgery is lower with spinal anesthesia because that's one of the things we worry about after knee replacements is, is what we call pulmonary emboli or uh, clots in the veins. And when you have spinal anesthesia, the risk of that goes down. It's safer for folks who have difficulty breathing uh, and it's easier on, on the heart. So for those reasons, we usually do do a spinal. In addition to that, we heavily sedate patients. So they're not awake, they're sort of s s in, a, in a trance or, or snoring, but they're, we don't have a breathing tube down. Not everyone is eligible for a spinal. Some people have had a back operation, the spine is fused, we can't get the medicine in there. So I'll do those patients under a general anesthesia as well. Both, both are reasonable, uh, just spinal has a little bit of safety advantages. Mm. Okay. Um, now for that type of procedure, is that a um, outpatient surgery or is there typically a hospital stay with that? Mm, that's another excellent question. So that's changing. So when I was in training, which I hate to say is about almost 20 years ago, but everyone stayed for three to four days in the hospital, sometimes up to a week, and everyone went to inpatient rehab for another week or two. That has been, um, you know, that has been changing over time. And and the outcomes are the same. Patients are doing just as well. But now I would say the average length of stay in the hospital for me is almost overnight and go home the next day. Maybe they'll stay two days. Uh, and in some centers, they're actually doing the surgery a same day surgery. So, but you have to really have a lot of things in order to make it a same day operation. Uh, the home has to be prepared. 
uh, a lot of patients will have a nurse, you know, right at the home. So you're, you're almost prepping the home to be like a mini hospital. But uh, so, but the stays are definitely lower and they're getting even lower. Gotcha. So uh, we do have a question about meniscus repair. So uh, one of our attendees would like to know what are the surgical and non-surgical options available for meniscus yeah. repair? Yeah, I mean, frankly, uh, I'll answer any knee question. I know I focused on arthritis, but you know, I do a lot of meniscus surgery. So, so when meniscus is tear, which is a very common injury, what we look at is, let me see if I go back here. Um, uh, so if we look at this picture, can you, can you guys see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at this meniscus, there's a central portion of the meniscus and then the peripheral portion. So the part of the meniscus that's in the middle of the knee is essentially avascular or it has no blood supply. So when you have a tear through a meniscus in this zone, even if I stitch it back together, the chances of it healing is very poor because there's no blood supply to the meniscus. And without blood, you can't bring cells, the healing cells to affect healing. Now, when tears occur in the periphery of the meniscus, uh, then oftentimes we can stitch them together and they will heal. So we use internal stitches in the knee. We have these cool devices that can uh, uh, shoot sutures in, in the knee to, to sew men meniscuses together. So when I, when I counsel a patient who has a meniscus tear, I look at, oh, and the other thing that affects it is, is age. Uh, so uh, over, over 40 and 50 meniscus repa repairs where we sew them together, the failure rate's pretty high. Whereas uh, when, when uh, if, if I'll see a meniscus repair in a teenager or someone in their 20s or 30s, I'll make every effort I can to repair that meniscus. Uh, and really sew it back together as opposed to just uh, trimming it and taking the torn part out of the knee. I don't know if I answered the question there. I hope I did. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, as far as like, so non-surgical though, they're, for the repairing it, there, there really isn't a non-surgical option, correct? Well, it, it, yeah, I mean, un unfortunately meniscuses, when they tear, they right. will not heal themselves. So, and that's the problem with cartilage. Uh, meniscus is a type of cartilage. It's, it's called fiber cartilage or type one cartilage, whereas this articular cartilage is type two, but e either one, when they tear, they're torn. So you either live with it uh, or you address it. And, you know, it'd be, it'd be great if cartilage healed. I, I, I probably wouldn't have much to do, but, you know, it, it, sadly, it, cartilage does not heal. So if it is torn, if you do tear your meniscus, some, some patients don't have all that much pain with a torn meniscus. They, they might have very minimal symptoms. And that's someone I would, I would put in physical therapy, make them a little cortisone shot and just watch them and see how they do. And then we could always address it in six months or three months if the pain got worse. I mean, those, that's very reasonable. You know, meniscus tears are very common and we certainly don't treat all of them. A lot of it are just treated with rest and just let the pain go away. Right. So like, if you know, if someone had a hole in theirs, um, would that be something, I mean, that, that sounds, you know, maybe a little bit more severe than a tear. I, I, I don't quite know, but, you know, one of our attendees is saying, you know, if they were told that they have a hole in theirs, but they were also told that someday it just might be fine. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. So, okay. uh, a hole can fill in, whereas it, it, think of it like a piece of paper. If you had a hole in the middle of the paper, I would much rather have that than if I ripped the paper down the half, you know, then it's flopping around. That tends to be what causes pain. So if someone just had a, a little hole in their meniscus, that's something I would really try to watch and hope that it healed and that the pain went away. Uh, and then I would only treat, address that from a surgical perspective if after several months, just the pain was unrelenting. Uh, whereas if you rip the meniscus and then what happens is that piece of the meniscus kind of flops around the knee and becomes unstable and almost functions like a, like a loose pebble. If you've ever had a pebble in your shoe, you can see how sometimes it's in a, a spot where maybe you don't feel it. And then sometimes it gets right under the ball of the foot and it's quite 
annoying. And that's sort of how meniscuses act when they tear in the knee. You know, on some days you might have zero pain. And then some days it, it may be just a killer. So we would, you know, I, I would, I would watch and, and wait and see how consistent the, the, the feelings of pain were before we opted for any kind of procedure. Great. Um, so we have another question on Euflexa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yep. Um, is a treatment. So if it has given someone relief in the past, how often can that in injection be repeated? Um, especially for someone with a torn meniscus sure. or an yeah. OA, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what an OA, uh, actually I do, what is OA? It's arthritis. OA stands for osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, right. Yep. So how, how often could that treatment be done? So Euflexa is, is a very common, I, I, I use it quite a bit. It can be done. Uh, so Medicare will, will cover it meaning pay for it every six months. So for someone who responds well to Euflexa injections, I'll, I'll do that twice a year for a patient, okay? Uh, it could be done more frequently, but then it just becomes a, a payment issue. Uh, so I, I do have some patients who would, who would like it more frequently than every six months, but it's just only covered by insurance every six months. So they'll just pay for it themselves and then I'll do it every three months or two months or whatever. But there's, there's really no limit to, to how frequently it can be injected. Uh, but if, if you want uh, it covered or paid for, it's, it's twice a year. Got it. Okay, so I, I was just doing a quick review just to make sure that we haven't missed any questions. And I, I think we've, we've covered off on everything that everyone submitted. Um, if we haven't, covered your question. If you want to, you know, make sure that you send it to Elise Toloni so I can take a look. Just give it more second to see. Um, but if not, I think I just want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening and uh, for submitting some really great questions. And um, Thank Dr. Enzarello for this, um, you know, the great information that he shared with us this evening. And again, also to the Fairlawn Library for hosting us. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and uh, I'm certainly happy to see anyone. Our office is right on Route 17 in Paramus. And uh, uh, let me know if you need anything. Great. And it, again, the contact information is, is right on the slide there. And you have the link, I shared it in the chat, but Mary also has it from the Fairlawn Library if you wanna take a look at the slides after. Um, and you can also find information on Dr. Enzarello and our orthopedics practice at smgortho.com. So thank you everyone and have a safe evening.